My name is Kevin Barrows, and I'm a physician at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. Um, I'm director of mindfulness programs there, and I'm also a physician in the clinic um, practicing integrative medicine. And tonight, um, we've got this topic that I love, um, and I hope you'll enjoy it with me. Um, there's a lot we can do. I'm hoping it'll be interesting and some fun, and, um, and I hope to have good dialogue with you along the way as well. Um, do you normally take a break, or is it just all the way through? Okay, all right, let's do that then. And um, if at any point you can't hear me or something, raise your hand because I'm this thing's in my back pocket, and if it if it cuts out, let me know. Um, all right, let's jump in. Let me show you um, an outline of what I'd like to do. Talking about mind body medicine, mind body spirit medicine. Um, first of all, the history and definition. How, how, how would you define this? I think we all have sort of an, an intuitive sense of what this is, but um, it's fun to sort of think of it from different angles. And also, what's the history of this? There's also a lot of different lines of evidence that the, the mind is affecting our health and vice versa, the body affecting the mind. And that's really... Um, I think surprising to go through and see. And then my favorite part, the clinical part, is actually look at some of these therapies, meditation, biofeedback, and um, review some of the studies that prove that these things work or don't work. And then at the bottom here, and I know, I know for the video thing I'm not supposed to stray too far from the podium, but it's very much my nature to be moving around, so um, I'll try to keep on a short leash. Um, but this, this uh, era three medicine, this is an idea of Dr. Larry Dossie, um, who's an author. I'll explain more as we get to that part of our talk. And it's just really interesting. It's a really fun thought experiment that we can do together that's very relevant to this. And then try to come to some conclusion and, and have a discussion. So, you know, as I think about this topic, the thing that impresses me, just a few general ideas. One is that it's just everywhere. And I think of all the different clinical settings I've worked in, and even not even in medicine, just in life. Um, I feel like I think we could pretty much all find examples of this in our own lives where your mind and body, um, it's, it's very apparent that they're influencing each other. You can think of times when you've been very emotionally um, agitated or maybe feeling very emotionally well uh, or maybe uh, the body was ill and what effect that had on the mind or certain medicines you could take and how that can affect both body and mind. So I think even in our own lives we can see that this is everywhere. It's also not completely understood. Uh, that's an understatement. <laughs> um, it's, and actually, it's part of the reason I think that it's very exciting, this field. It's mysterious in this way. And it's also the parts of medicine that I especially like, I feel like maybe are attributable to this, this phenomenon of mind, body, spirit, medicine. You know, you've all heard stories, or maybe you've lived a story where the doctor, someone said, oh, the doctor said I had six months, and that was 10 years ago, this kind of thing. Or, or if, you, if you haven't heard such stories, go to, um, there's a, a famous conference called Cancer as a Turning Point. It's a very large one. They just had it in San Francisco last year, and um, it's mostly cancer survivors and, and clinicians involved with cancer care and family members of people with cancer, and uh, the stories are incredible. Just the woman who runs it uh, is up there, and, and she's you know, amazing. She had breast cancer with eight recurrences, and each time you know, with this horrible prognosis, and yet there she is you know, 12 years later. So um, there's something mysterious going on, and it's good. And I also think that some of the really human and humanistic aspects of medicine come out of this um, kind of mysterious f uh, phenomenon. Our capacity to transcend our circumstances, our outward physical health circumstances, I think uh, this, is, this is what we're talking about. Um, you might have heard the, the old uh, notion, the distinction between healing and curing. Um, that, um, and you might have known people or you yourself have gone through something where 
the, the disease or, or whatever is not completely cured or, or uh, removed, and yet the person can find uh, deep, deep wholeness, deep healing, even though not cured. So this area of mind, body, spirit, medicine, I think, is very rich, very hopeful, um, and to me, it's, it's one of the most attractive parts of, of healthcare. So I feel like, I, you know, I wasn't there uh, how many hundreds of thousands of years ago when um, Homo sapiens started, but I really believe that this kind of relationship must have always been present. In fact, it might not just be humans, it's very possibly animals as well, I don't know. But um, I feel like talking about how the mind influences the body and how the body influences the mind, this has uh, almost certainly been present ever since the very beginning, even, even pre-verbal uh, man, I would, I would posit. However, for our purposes, it was in the 1950s, really, but 60s when it kind of went, it came out of academia and was actually uh, part of uh, something that we would experience in the general public. Uh, there was this renaissance. But let me put something in perspective first. Um, the reason we had to put the mind-body connection back together is because we took it apart. Um, and most other um, cultures, uh, and, and, and actually, if you look at, um, if you look chronologically at human history, um, the vast majority, I mean, it would probably literally be something like 99, 99.5% of human history, um, mind, body, that concept uh, wouldn't have even existed because it would just have been inherent in the whole notion of healing. And even today, where we have had this split that we're bringing back together, most cultures, I would say, on the planet right now, most people are using systems of healing where this notion uh, has always been present. So here's a, here's a, um, a medicine man from, uh, I don't know which, Plains Indians, I don't know which tribe. Um, this is a female uh, shaman from um, maybe Nepal. Um, I love the caption on this one, struggle of a Mahekotateri shaman against death. When you go to your doctor, this is not what happens, you know, this, he's grabbing you and you're, you're it's, you know, you got allergies, it gives you a nasal spray or something. Um, so this, I love the drama of this, this is the doctor I want to be. <laughs> Here's a very happy shaman from uh, Namibia. Um, I believe this one's from Guatemala, another Plains Indian. Um, very moving photograph holding the, the buffalo skull uh, to the spirits. So really, just to remember before we start talking about, you know, guided imagery and all the little things we're so excited about in the last uh, 50 years here in our system, really the rest of the world and, and, and even our ancestors for most of history, um, this split was, was never made. So back again, so, so in the 60s is really when this uh, first came out of academia and really caught uh, interest. And you know, it fit in with everything else going on in the 60s, um, empowerment and awakening and new frontiers. So let's get to a definition now. Um, I think most of us, if you don't examine this, this um, you know, deeply, then someone just says, well, what do you think mind-body medicine is? You'd probably say something like this. Well, it's when you do something with your mind that influences the health of your body. And that's, that's a fine definition. Um, it's, it's a good working definition to start with. But I, f well, let me also point out, um, all right. So the NIH definition, I must have cut it out of here, is, is also unsatisfying. Um, it's, it's a, it's a um, definition of exclusion. It says something like mind-body medicine is, um, uh, or mind-body therapies are um, therapies uh, with behavioral, psychological, or spiritual um, orientation not commonly used. So that's, that's really just a big catch-all basket, not, not things that are commonly used. Um, that's an interesting definition, too, because it's fluid. You know, once something becomes commonly used, it wouldn't fit in the definition anymore. But the limitations to thinking about it this, this way and, and the NIH definition is it's dualistic, for starters. So mind, body. 
So even that term, mind-body medicine, so already just inherent in that term, the mind is separate from the body. Let's talk about how they're related. See, already we enter into the language that implies they're separate. So let's pretend whenever I say mind-body today, um, there's a hyphen between them, and it's one word, mind-body. That's the best I can do. Um, there's also another um, something we're missing in this traditional definition, and that is the directionality. So yes, okay, my mind can affect my body, but what about vice versa? We all have experience with this. There's a lot of good scientific literature on this too. You can do things with your body that influence your mind. So very simply, um, aerobic exercise reduces depression. That's an example by in actually affecting levels of neurotransmitters. Um, if you've done yoga, you know you feel very lovely and very different after yoga. And so what's going on there? So we're doing something with the body that's affecting the mind. So it's, it's, um, it's not separate. Um, the worst joke about this is the mind and the body are linked. It's the neck. Um, <laughs> but I think to think of it as just one unit. OK, let me give you some, some quotations. And you guess who's saying this. These are, these are, these are my, my um, professional elders. And they're, they're saying uh, what we're saying. So who might have said this? You ought not to attempt to cure the body without the soul. For this is the greatest error of our day in the treatment of the human body, that physicians separate the soul from the body. What do you think? Oh, oh, is it in the handout? I, oh, man. I asked them not to do that. OK, don't look. Don't look. Don't look anymore. See, oh, you, OK. What you would have said, if you didn't have the answer, is someone more contemporary. You would have said, um, you know, I don't know, <laughs> not Aristotle, even more contemporary than that. So, you know, because it, it, to me, this quotation, it sounds, oh, yes, this is, um, you, know, I'm, you know, you could hear this from a doctor these days, right? Um, so, all right, so stop looking at your notes. All right, how about this one for those of you who haven't looked at your notes? The separation of psychology from the premises of biology is purely artificial because the human psyche lives in an indissoluble union with the body. Really good guess. Who would be, after Freud, your next? Jung. Jung. It's more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of a disease a person has. This is often attributed to Sir William Osler, but it actually goes back further. Hippocrates. So this is not a new idea. You know, the father of, of Western medicine, Hippocrates. So, so this is not a new idea, is it? Um, that's my point with this. And I really feel like it's, it's, been, it's been present probably. It's just inherent in who we are as organisms and how we, how we uh, heal. So let's look um, at some of the evidence that's, I think, really interesting and before we look at some of the clinical matters. So there are these different levels of evidence. Um, um, and a lot of this material that I'm about to present, I got from, I've, I've looked into it um, independently, but, but it's put together in um, John Kabat-Zinn's book, Full Catastrophe Living, if you know that book. So there's these different levels of evidence. The way we think that that can be affecting our health our emotions, that that could be affecting our health. The level of social uh, expression, social engagement that we have, that that's affecting our health. And finally, our um, expression of spirituality. These, all at these different levels, sort of going from the most sort of personal, private, that is your thoughts, to the outward uh, community in terms of the uh, society and um, religious group. Um, and there's also some miscellaneous medical phenomena that you're familiar with that I'll, I'll present as another line of evidence. Okay, so first of all, just a, just a few things um, uh, in terms of uh, examples of this that are, you know, just off the top of my head that I think you'll all recognize. So the placebo effect, we're familiar with that. Normally, it's been treated in science as a nuisance because we want to see if our drug or our therapy works. And darn it, that placebo effect, that works too. So we have to make sure our new therapy does better than the placebo. So it's always been this kind of nuisance thing. Um, and it's been studied independently um, along the, the way for years now. But I think integrative medicine, um, which 
this series is sort of tackling topics in integrative medicine. Integrative medicine as a field has especially embraced this, and there are, there's a lot more acti research activity now in this. What is the placebo effect? How does it work? And you know, it's, it's a completely different perspective to look at it. Instead of a nuisance, like we have to prove that it works better than aspirin, or rather we have to prove that our aspirin works better than the placebo, um, it's, my goodness, placebo works. That's great. <laughs> that, it's certainly a safe medicine. And so how's it working? How can, we, how can we optimize it? I should have put a cartoon in here that I have. I just thought of it. Um, and the guy goes to the pharmacist and uh, think how it goes. Um, it's kind of funny, too, because the pharmacist is way up, the counter is way up high, and it's almost like this, you know, and the patient's there, and the patient's looking up, and the, and the, the pharmacist says, um, says, all the medicines are very cheap here because they're placebos, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so the placebo is very real. In fact, in some states, it's typically, you know, it's, this is a broad stroke um, generalization, but 30% um, 30 30, 30 better, or 30% of the time you'll get better with placebo. But this varies, and it goes as high as 80% in some studies. Um, particularly, I remember studies of knee, um, osteoarthritis of the knee. There's, uh, I remember reading a study where there was a therapy, a topical uh, therapy, um, and um, the application of the placebo yielded an 80% benefit. And I think that's because you can imagine there's more uh, sort of um, psychological effect that you're actually touching your own knee. You're rubbing this thing on your knee and you're wanting it to be better. And you're thinking maybe this is a, you don't know it's the placebo, you know, maybe this is a really good medicine. And so that placebo effect was especially strong. But really, in almost any situation, there's pl uh, placebo surgery. You know, if you, if you, if usually this is unintentional, but you can you put under and um, everything uh, leading up. You go through preoperative evaluation. You do the whole thing, and you're put under. No surgery. You're brought out, and you're a certain percentage of the time you're better. <laughs> I don't know specifically the studies on that because usually, like I say, it's a mistake, you know? If something's gone wrong so they can't do the surgery. So it's not like someone has embarked on a, on a study to say, okay, let's look at all the, let's look at all the, part this particular surgery type and we'll randomize people to really get the surgery in these ones. We won't really give it to them. That would be unethical. So, but, so as, it, as the data presents just from, um, just from you know, trial and error of, of clinical medicine, there's evidence for that. Cytokines are chemicals that your cells uh, secrete to, to, to um, communicate with uh, other parts of the body, other cells and nerves. And um, uh, I'll use interferon as an example. Interferon comes from your white blood cells. And, but we've also now produced it um, with the, the advances in um, recombinant uh, DNA technology so that it's a, it's a medicine and it's useful for uh, hepatitis. Uh, chronic hepatitis and other things. So here's, some, here's a chemical that your own body makes. So you get, you get a virus, say, you get infected with a cold or flu. Your white blood cells get very excited and they do all sorts of things. One thing is they secrete this interferon. The interferon has specific effects on how the white blood cells are going to behave that are beneficial, presumably, to you fighting that virus. But the interferon also causes depression. It makes your mood go down. And isn't that your experience? Like when you get the flu or, or something, you know, you, you kind of, you don't want to go to parties, do you? You know, you want to just sort of, just kind of crunch down and stay alone for a day or two. Um, so it's, it's, you could argue it's actually adaptive. I don't know. But it's so interesting that this, this, this um, well, it's a medicine and it's, it's a natural cytokine is affecting your mind. And of course, you've taken medicines, I'm sure, before. I mean, even just like Benadryl or something. It'll sedate you, or it can even change your, uh, your personality a little bit. So it's very obvious uh, that um, this is one package here, mind-body. There are lots of medical conditions, too, where the, um, 
you, where it's, it's sort of well known and documented that um, your state of mind it actually affects the disease process. So irritable bowel syndrome is one where this is common. And these are generalizations. I'm not saying every case of irritable bowel, et cetera. Um, there are a lot of dermatologic conditions like eczema and psoriasis where your emotional state can affect the disease. And again, it's not every patient, but it's common. And, it's, and if you do a study, it's happening to enough patients that it's showing up in the study. Autoimmune diseases as well. So um, those are just some miscellaneous examples of how, how this mind is connected to this body. Now I'd like to examine these different levels. Oh, and by the way, my slides here are going to be that's occasionally a little bit different. I made some changes since this came out. So there's just a few, a uh, couple of typos were corrected, and I've added just a couple of things. Um, Oh, and by the way, there are more quotations at the end of the talk, so don't look ahead and see who made the quotations. So, so first of all, the fact that the way you think can affect your health, we'll do that one first. Then we'll look at how your emotions affect your health, and then we'll look at um, uh, social and spiritual. So attributional style, you, we know this as pessimism, pessimistic and optimistic. Those are attributional styles. The, so, so, you know, we use those terms in, in our lay language, but they have specific psychological meaning uh, for the research psychologists. So if, I'll give you an example, the distinction. Um, there are three, well, um, personalizing, generalizing, and catastrophizing are three um, habits of mind that will distinguish the two, pe the pessimistic and the optimistic attributional style. So personalizing, let me give you an example. Um, Say, say right now my computer goes out here. It just goes dead and then we lose the slides. Personalizing would be, um, oh God, this always happens to me. I have such bad luck. Uh, you know, my, I, my life is such a struggle and da 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 da. Um, and you can imagine that's, that's going to create a lot of suffering. Um, uh, generalizing is taking this and then assuming everything is, so for example, the slides go out. Oh no, you know, I wonder if the lights, up. maybe the TV's not going to work and the mic's going to go dead and people are going to start throwing tomatoes or something. So um, this idea, once one thing goes wrong and your mind has the habit of, well now, you know, maybe now everything's going to go wrong. And then catastrophizing is a similar phenomenon where um, the slides go out and I immediately go to the catastrophe. Oh, that's it. The, whole, the lecture is going to be a bomb. There's no chance it's going to be horrible, you know. Um, so doing that uh, is, is are characteristics of the pessimistic attributional style. Not doing that are characteristics of the optimistic uh, attributional style. And what I'm about to describe, these are, these are correlations, and we have to be so careful about causality and correlation. In fact, if there's one thing I like to tell people when you're reading you know, the newspaper and the Time magazine and all this, there's a lot of what I call pseudoscience, and um, and you just it just there's it's never ending. It's just um, uh, don't you wonder like in the newspaper you read about all these incredible studies and stuff, and then nothing ever comes of it, <laughs> right? Um, and this is why two things can be correlated and not necessarily have a causal relationship. Causal relationship is a much more profound relationship. So here's the example you always learn in medical school. Um, if you uh, did a study of who are c carrying matches for lighting a fire, who are carrying matches in their pocket, and then follow them and see how many of them get lung cancer, you'd notice, oh, people who carry matches are more likely to get lung cancer. That's accurate. But it's not accurate to conclude matches cause lung cancer, right? It's the smoking. So. So there's a, there'd be a correlation between match, carrying matches and getting lung cancer, but, there's, but it's not necessarily causal. So these are, these are correlational. Um, your pessimistic or, at, or optimistic attribution style, if you have cancer, it correlates with your um, life expectancy. So in other words, um, say I have uh, lung cancer and my twin Kevin here has lung cancer, and he's the pessimist, and I'm the optimist. Um, typically, you know, you want to do this on a on a larger scale, like a, take a thousand such Kevins. <laughs> um, but this, the likelihood of the pessimist with cancer dying sooner is is significantly higher than the optimist. 
So does that mean pessimism is contributing to death? That, that would be a causal inference, and we don't know. But, but it's certainly very strikingly clearly observed. Also, overall mortality. So for all of us who are going to die, um, uh, the attrib there's a correlation between your pessimistic or optimistic and life expectancy. Um, and obviously, depression, you can imagine. I mean, someone with a pessimistic attributional style, or when any of us has a pessimistic attributional style, <coughs> we're more likely to get major depression. Um, there's a, so that's one way in which your thinking is potentially influencing your health, or at least is related. Another is this, um, another psychological construct um, known as self-efficacy. This was developed by, I think, Dr. Bandura at Stanford. And um, self-efficacy is mostly your sense of that, that you can do something, that you can make a difference, that, that you can affect your situation. So it's most striking in people who've had a heart attack. If they, if you interview them, if they feel like Oh, okay, I've had this heart attack, but I know, you know, if I improve my diet and if I exercise and I, you know, um, attend to the, the emotional relationships in my life, you know, I know I can live long, I'll be okay, it's going to help if I do those things. This sense of, of um, I can do something about this, I can impact this, correlates with uh, fewer, with less death and less repeat heart attack. Whereas the folks who feel like, oh my God, I had this heart attack, there's, and there's like, you know, it just came out of the blue and you know, it'll just, it could happen again. There's nothing I can do about this. More, more likely to die after their heart attack. And you could say, well, if they don't think they can do anything, then maybe they're not engaging in the good diet and the exercise and all that. But, but these, these studies control for that. So uh, it actually appears possible that the way you're thinking about how well you, how much control you have, uh, how much influence you have, is, is affecting your, your actual uh, lifespan. Sense of coherence is another one. This was developed by Dr. Antonovsky. Uh, I forget where he is. Anyway, he looked at um, concentration camp survivors from World War II, and he found correlation there. The ones who survived had a much higher sense of coherence, and their sense of coherence is um, has different characteristics, but I'd say the central one is meaning. The people that could find meaning in what was happening survived more. So, you know, who knows, it'd be, you know, can you imagine, I mean, that sort of extreme situation, but, um, you know, to, to find some meaning in it, it, what it maybe it would be, uh, oh, this is, you know, this is, this is God's test for me, or, or, you know, something like that, where you can put it into a context that has some kind of meaning for you, this correlated Finally, uh, this another psychological construct called stress hardiness. This has three elements to it. Control, commitment, and challenge. Control is very similar to, to the self-efficacy, uh, Bandura's self-efficacy idea, the fact that you could actually have some control over your future. Uh, Commitment is the, the sense of how, how committed you are just to the things you do in your life. Like, do you, you know, your work and your relationships and just, do you feel, this is important, I'm, I'm engaged in this, that sense of commitment. And finally, challenge. Um, this almost fits into the pessimistic, optimistic, attributional style, but when, it, when, a, when something happens, unexpected, which is, you know, so many things, do you see it as a challenge? Or do you see it as, oh no, and, you know, here's a problem, here's a disaster. Here's... So seeing it more as a challenge, as something that can be, that has opportunity and that can be overcome and can even improve things, that, uh, that was, that's one of the uh, characteristics of stress hardiness. And in, this, in these studies, they looked at people who had stressful jobs. Um, well, e really stressful jobs. And, um, and they watched them over many years and their health outcomes. And the people who scored higher on these three, who had greater stress hardiness, control, commitment, challenge, um, had much less uh, detrimental health outcomes than the folks who, who scored lower in stress hardiness. So it's pretty, pretty, um, pretty strong correlational. I don't know if you really could ever do a causal, you know, it, it, this kind of experiment uh, was it's almost impossible to do. So this body of evidence and more, you know, that I don't even know about probably is, uh, is pretty compelling. I, I'd, I'd say it's just, it's quite clear. <laughs> so that's the way we think. How about the way we feel, the, our emotions? Well, for many years, the research was all on how negative emotions affect your health negatively. 
And that's, we have lots of uh, evidence for that now. Let me take a sip of water and then we'll talk more. So um, Dr. Meyer Friedman was a cardiologist here in San Francisco. He was at the Mount Zion campus. I don't know if any of you knew him or heard of him. He was famous for, this was in the 70s, um, uh, he was a cardiologist and, and, you know, I think heart disease was, uh, I think in terms of its toll, uh, it's still, you know, the number one killer, but I think, uh, I just remember reading, you know, uh, learning about heart disease in the 70s as being very just devastating. Like we didn't know every, you know, it was, it was just epidemic. It, we weren't making progress like we are now with it, and it, you know, it was uh, occurring at a younger age, and it's very severe, and lots of deaths. So there was this um, kind of scary uh, uh, epidemic hitting home especially, and Dr. Friedman was noticing, wow, a lot of the patients with these poor heart outcomes, these heart attacks and such, I'm noticing they're very, uh, you know, aggressive, hostile kind of personalities. So I wonder if that is contributing somehow to the heart disease. And he did studies, correlational studies that showed, oh yes, actually it is. And then over time now, it's been refined. The psychologists, you know, teased this out because they found people with that sort of the profile of hostility that, that were not uh, having increased heart disease. So they teased it out, and the, the hostility had different, different uh, elements to it. The, this type A personality, I'll call it, you, you know that term. This type A personality had different elements to it. It was the hostility element. It wasn't the hard driving or the impatience or the other parts of type A. It was the hostility. So sort of being perpetually angry, uh, that's the one that is, is most clearly correlating still to this day with increased heart disease. Um, and that's the development of heart disease. So um, the next thing I'll talk about is, is what w th this would be called what's primary prevention of heart disease or primary development of heart disease rather than secondary, meaning you've already got it, now how do we prevent you from, hey, from it getting worse or <coughs> from you dying from it? So, so hostility increases heart disease. Depression, and this is more recent, um, but a very solid uh, research data on this. Both primary and secondary heart disease is worsened with depression. So if you're depressed, you're more likely to develop heart disease. And if you're depressed and have heart disease, you're much more likely to die of the heart disease than someone who has heart disease and is not depressed. Three, up to three and a half times more likely in some studies. This is huge. Um, this is, this to me is one of the most Doctors who, who might not be as attentive to this mind-body idea know this. This is, like, this is, this is a very striking, and, and since coronary artery disease is such a, a major medical entity in our country, this is noticeable uh, by, by everyone. More recent and very interesting are the study of positive emotions. So we know negative emotions can negatively affect your health. Can positive emotions positively affect your health? Um, probably yes. So, there's a, a study called the Nun Study um, where they looked at 180 Catholic nuns somewhere like Pennsylvania or something, and when they went into the monastery, they had to write lengthy, um, part of their intake process and their interviewing and everything was to write this very lengthy um, essay and answer these questions. And some researchers uh, scored all those essays, this, you know, 60 years later, some researchers scored all those essays for positive content. So they'd pull, you know, Jane's <laughs> uh, uh, essay and, and how they described um, negative events in their life, um, how they looked at coming into the monastery, you know, and they would objectively as possible uh, score it for, for the, how positive it sounded. And then they looked at um, mortality for these women 60 years later, and people, the, the, these are all like in their 20s, tw the average age was 22 when they did this. Um, people who scored higher in the, I think they broke it into quartiles, into fourths. The highest fourth, the people who were most positive, were two and a half times more likely to still be alive. 60 years later. And the ones who were in the bottom quartile who were kind of negative in their essays at, at that early age were more likely to be dead, two and a half times more likely to be dead. So that's, that was an eye opener for people. 
There's another study, much larger, over 2,000 patients of Mexican American elders in border states like California, Arkansas, and, uh, or sorry, Arizona, and um, Texas, I think. And um, they only followed them for two years, but already they found an effect. And it's the same idea. They did interviews, and they gave them a, 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 um, a questionnaire known as the, the CESD. So for those of you who are clinicians, that's the uh, Center for Epidemiologic Studies Depression Scale, which has some positive affect questions and negative affect questions, and the overall score we use to, to assess depression. They, they interviewed these elders, and they scored them on the CESD, and uh, then they followed them for just two years. And in two years, they found, again, the ones who, who sort of reported their life experiences more positively were less likely to be dead and much more likely to be independent still. Uh, this ADL, that's a, um, a medical term, activities of daily life, the really basic things you need to do to, be, to live independently, like uh, you know, uh, feeding yourself and getting to the toilet and being able to walk a short distance. So that's another impressive study. And then one of my colleagues at the Osher Center, um, Judy Moskowitz, she looked at, uh, this is uh, San, Francisco Mel uh, San Francisco Men's Health Study, um, which was a study of men who are HIV positive and, and followed them, uh, I think four, 400 men, um, and followed them. They also did this CESD, which, which is a scale that has some positive questions and some negative questions. And Judy went back. This data had already been looked at, and they showed, oh, yes, depression correlates with, with development of AIDS and dying from AIDS. So that was impressive. But Judy that just took out the positive questions, and, it turns, and, then she, and the negative ones. She separated them. And it turned out it was the positive affect that was protective. It wasn't that the negative affect was harmful. So let me explain. So for the men who reported uh, in, the, in this scale, the ones who measured more positive were less likely to be dead three years later, even less. Um, the, um, the ones who, and then there, there was actually no difference on the negative subscale of the CESD. So presumably, the positive affect was explaining the whole effect uh, of these men uh, living or dying with HIV. Okay, so we've done thoughts, how thinking affects your health, emotions, how emotions might affect your health. So now we'll go to sort of to the next level, and that's social. So we know people, again, this is not necessarily causal, um, but unmarried people have more health problems and die sooner than married people. It's just a fact. So that's one sort of superficial uh, correlation. Um, more in-depth research has been done. And so first, the, the, the studies were, well, let's look at the number of social relationships people have. And clearly, people who were socially isolated were more likely to be, be ill and die. Um, and then someone said, well, wait, maybe instead of the number of social relationships, we should be looking at the quality of the social relationships. They, so they did that. And that was also positive. So it seems both correlate uh, with health. And finally, uh, I'm, I love dogs. <laughs> and so if you, um, it turns out, if you're a dog owner, you live longer after your heart attack. Um, there's, there, I found, when I was reviewing for this, I, I did find one study that refuted this from Australia. Um, but it, it was, um, there, there are m many more studies showing the positive correlation. People with animals, uh, maybe the, the inference, the implication is just that relationship is enough to, to um, foster this effect of social connection in, in improving health. So when you do this, when you search for this in the, uh, in the, the, the PubMed library system, PET, what you'll mostly get positron emission tomography studies. Um, so you have to put in like PET doggy or something. Um, OK, actually, an, and actually, if you really want to do search, I think it's called Animal Companions, and that'll bring up all the research on this. So how about, again, at a more communal level, how our relationships with one another affects our health? Um, and I know Dr. Rabo gave a great lecture on this. I didn't go to that one, but I've heard him do it before, and it's very thorough. And um, so all I'll say about it is this simple fact that frequency of religious attendance correlates with health. 
Okay, so that's, that's, that's a surrogate marker, right, for spirituality, because maybe you're going to church or temple or mosque out of guilt, you know, or out of obligation. I mean, there might be not good reasons that you're going. Um, but, but if you just take all comers, everybody who's going, the frequency of religious attendance actually predicts uh, health, and the NIH even says specifically with, with these, um, these conditions, the correlation's been shown. Um, again, it's, it's a very crude marker, um, and as we know, spiritu spirituality can be very different than religion, <laughs> um, but it's just, it's just a, uh, a kind of a, a crude snapshot measure to look at this issue. Um, I would also say these studies are controlled. People, people who um, adhere to religion more often don't, don't have a, such negative health habits like drinking, smoking, unsafe, unsafe sex. So um, you, those are controlled for. Uh, and still this correlation is found. I was told that we do questions at the end. Has that been the format? Or do you want to? Yeah. That's what it's, okay. Okay, so, so that's the evidence, um, some of the evidence for how our health is being affected by these mental, emotional, spiritual um, dimensions. Let's go to these actual therapies that try to exploit this relationship. So like meditation and biofeedback and hypnosis and stuff. In fact, I'd like to do a meditation with you. Let me, 7.45, let's see, we have until 8.45. Okay, so we'll do a brief, very brief meditation. Um, so first of all, the definition, I love this definition, the self-regulation of attention. So you can do whatever you want with your attention like right now, you might be paying attention to me, or you might, you might be thinking about you know, dessert, or you might be thinking, you know, or you could be you know, looking at the, something else, I don't know. Um, but this, where you put your attention is, is very powerful and is, is in your control. So meditation is just you regulating what you do with that attention in a more kind of disciplined way. There are, there are different kinds of meditation. I won't get into uh, mindfulness meditation um, and concentration meditations are the two ma major categories. When you look at all the studies that have been done on meditation for health conditions, um, far and away mental health is the one that it is very obviously positive, specifically major depression, anxiety disorders, but also chronic pain. And what's interesting here with chronic pain is when you look at the chronic pain studies, some people get less pain, yay. Some people don't get less pain, but they get less suffering. That's, that, to me, speaks a lot about meditation. So, so even if it's not necessarily changing the outward circumstance that's causing distress, it changes the inward response to that external. So the, we're, we're sort of addressing more the internal response to the external circumstance, which we know sometimes we can't control those external circumstances. Um, cancer, and I don't mean here length of your life, but rather the quality of your life with cancer, sleep, fatigue, um, a lot of emotion, ang anxiety, depression, anger. Um, so let, let's do a little meditation right now. And so for the, the video thing, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stray here, so just so you know. So this will just take, I don't know, five minutes. And I'd like you to just find a position that's comfortable for you. And I'll use my magic bell here to, to start us and to end. And at the end, I'll, I'll hit it three times, a little bit louder each time, so we can sort of come out gently. Um, so here we go. So if you're comfortable closing your eyes right now, that's, that's the best way to harness uh, your full attention. And let's start, let's bring our attention to the most uh, basic aspect of our experience, the, the body, the physical experience of being here. 
So just bring your awareness to your body. Just feel your body. It's that simple. You can feel, for example, where you're pressing against the chair, you know, your buttocks bearing weight, your back touching the back of the chair, perhaps. And the trick with um, meditation is we're trying to develop a sustained attention. So, for example, let's go to the feet and feel the, the feet touching the floor. Um, I think normally we're in the habit of mind where we just go there, feel the feet for a moment, and then our mind wanders off, feeling like it's accomplished what it was supposed to. But for now, I'd like you to go to your feet and let's stay there for a few seconds or longer if you can. See if you can get into it with great sensitivity and discover the, the nuance of experience. For example, is the weight distributed evenly? Foot to foot or even just within one foot? Just something, just a subtle question you can examine by right? feeling your feet as they contact the floor right now. And then, um, due to time, I'll just bring us now to sort of the whole body. So we were feeling the buttocks and the back and the feet. But see if you can just get a sense for a moment of the body as a whole. If you notice any tension that you want to let go of, please do. But unlike when we're preparing for sleep, we'll let the body be at ease, but we're going to try to keep mentally alert. It's a very um, interesting and can be pleasurable state we call restful alertness. Letting yourself be at ease, letting the body relax, and yet the mind is still sharp. feeling this body as a whole. Maybe you can notice uh, your pulse in different parts of your body. Maybe you can feel the quality of energy. Maybe there's a tense, vibrating energy. Or maybe, maybe you're tired and it's a heavy, solid energy. When we get distracted by noises or by other thoughts or physical sensations, we just remind ourselves to come back. And now, instead of just the body, I'd like us to come back to the breath. So feeling the, the belly, feeling the breath in the belly. Again, with a sustained attention really feeling the whole process of breathing, the whole breath cycle. Your mind almost certainly will wander. And so you just come back to the belly, to the breath. You don't have to breathe in any particular way. You just observe. You just feel this breath breathe itself. Before we leave the breath, I just want to um, offer something. Experienced meditators claim that no two breaths are exactly alike. There's a subtle difference in some way from one breath to the next. See if that's true in your experience right now as you're observing the breath in the belly. And then before we leave the breath, one more question to sort of heighten your awareness. Assuming you're breathing through your nose, can you feel the exhalation current coming out of the nose and touching the skin above your upper lip? Is that possible for you right now?
And then when you're ready, we'll make one last transition, paying attention just as we were to the body, now to the mind. Again, and not trying to change anything. We're just here to observe and experience. So just noticing in the emotional realm, anything that's present. Are you irritated? Are you contented? Are you happy? Are you sad? Is it neutral? Just noticing, not needing to change anything, just noticing. Similarly, your thoughts. Just noticing. Are they thoughts about, as, as the mind has wandered inevitably during this exercise, where has it wandered to? Thoughts about food, thoughts about work, about friends or family. It's interesting. I'll ring the bell to end soon. So I'd like you to come back to your breath and just let go of everything that we've done. <laughs> you don't have to hold on to anything. You don't have to remember anything or plan anything or write anything down. Just come back to the very, very utterly simple experience of just feeling your breath in your belly for these last moments. If you haven't already opened your eyes, you can open them now and bring your awareness back to the room. Let me take two minutes of our question time and insert it now and just hear anything about your experience with that, anything at all. Honesty, please. Anything you noticed or that was interesting to you? Yeah. Yeah. Good. I. I. Um, it's not always. So some people might not have had that. Um, any individual meditation, anything could come up, you know. Um, but overall, it tends to be relaxing, and, and we're not going to have time to get into this, but you might already know the, the sympathetic and parasympathetic limbs of the nervous system. The sympathetic is the fight or flight one. That gets us all ready to, to run for our lives. Um, the parasympathetic uh, does the opposite. It, it prepares us to sort of uh, rest and restore and nourish. And um, when we meditate, this is from data in the 70s, um, our parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated and our sympathetic tone decreases. So we literally relax. <laughs> our muscle tone decreases, our respiratory rate slows, our metabolism slows. Yes? Yes? I, yeah, so the, um, you might have noticed in this meditation, there was no directive except to be aware. In other words, um, this is a fundamental thing about, about at least mindfulness meditation. Um, we're not trying to actually do anything. 
Um, we often talk about being versus doing. We spend most of our waking hours doing, doing, doing. And so meditation is more being. So there was no, I wasn't, tr unlike the other therapies I'm about to mention, there was no uh, specific goal, really. You didn't have to relax. And you didn't have to do anything except try to be aware. And even if your mind is wandering, well, then you're aware of that. So you pretty much can't lose. And I'm not asking you to do anything. It's really just an invitation to step into your present moment and your awareness. Um, whereas the next therapies, let me, let me use that as a segue. Uh, oh, first of all, you know, it's, meditation is big now. <laughs> so there's a lot of things I've noticed lately. So I'll skip these. Um, so say, for example, um, biofeedback. Although the, the nurse I work with at um, the Osher Center, she does this very skillfully with a kind of psychological um, approach where it's not necessarily always trying to achieve a certain end. But typically, biofeedback is used in that way. For example, uh, you have migraine headaches, and you want to go see the biofeedback person to learn how to reduce those migraine headaches. You know, that's very clearly what you're trying to do. And so the therapy is used to try to achieve this outcome very, very deliberately. Um, so meditation is different that way. Anyway, so what is biofeedback? Um, it's a system whereby some function, some physiologic function of yours is measured by a computer and then fed back to you. Um, and the, f the exciting thing is by doing that, we can perhaps gain control over functions in our nervous system that were not previously under conscious control. So for example, um, Teresa, who I work with at the Osher Center, she can measure your muscle tension. There's a little thing that, um, when your muscles contract, they emit a little bit of electricity. So you can put on an EMG monitor and, and we can see. So for example, she typically puts them up here because when people are stressed, you know, they're like this. Um, and so that helps people determine, like say someone has chronic neck pain or something, she can help them they can see on the computer screen, oh, yeah, my right shoulder is, you know, very, is very tense, and my left one's not. And they can start to, in their mind, relax it, and then they can see, oh, yeah, it's working. So there's that feedback, thus the term biofeedback. Um, if, oh, I should mention, besides the muscle tension, also skin temperature, which is a, a surrogate for how stressed you are. Like when you got relaxed, probably you got a little bit warmer, and so the biofeedback would, would tell you that. Also, your heart rate your heart rate variability, which is, a, is a, a measure of how your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems are, are ultimately balancing out. How, how, what's the overall tone? Um, uh, what else? Uh, brain waves can be measured. Uh, that's called neurofeedback. Um, uh, uh, not, not so much research on that yet. Um, also, um, oh, uh, galvanic skin resistance, which is how much you're sweating which you say, well, I'm not sweating. Well, you are, microscopically, you are. Uh, and that's a measure also of how stressed you are. The more stressed you are, the more you sweat. So um, as the resistance goes down, that means you're getting more stress. So Teresa hooks you up, and you, it's all on the computer. And sometimes, it's, 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 um, especially with kids, it comes back. It's a game. It's not just like numbers. You can do that, too. But it's, it can be a game, you know? And, like you're in a hot air balloon, and the more relaxed you get, the higher up the balloon goes. And if the more stressed you get, the balloon starts to come down and gets stuck in a tree or something. So using biofeedback in medicine, here's what's been shown. Um, and this is done not at our center, but at, at the, um, uh, also at the Mount Zion campus. Um, um, fecal incontinence and, um, uh, let's see if, um, actually, it's not here, but urinary incontinence also is effective for this. Um, there's certain kinds of co constipation, actually, where it's due to chronic constipation, where it's due to the pelvic floor, the muscles of the pelvic floor. They don't relax like they're supposed to. So defecation is actually a complex process that requires some contraction of the colon, some relaxation of certain muscles in the pelvis, and contraction of others. And so if that's not all done in a coordinated fashion, uh, then people have chronic constipation, so biofeedback is effective for that kind of constipation. Enuresis, this is bedwetting in kids. Y you might know the bedwetting alarm. It's a, very, it's a very simple biofeedback system, really. Home biofeedback. 
Um, blood pressure, controversial, people argue about this. I, I, I've tried to review everything I could on this, and I feel like um, the, the, when people really put all the data together, there is a positive effect for hypertension. It's small, but it's significant. And every, every millimeter of mercury counts when you're treating hypertension. Uh, some, some pain and um, Raynaud's phenomenon, which is a, a contraction, an exaggerated contraction of the arteries in your fingers um, that cuts off the blood supply. With biofeedback, um, you can uh, uh, relax those arteries open and um, not suffer the consequences of Raynaud's. Um, let's see, what else did I want to say? Biofeedback. Oh, you can do it at home now because all the technology that we're developing. So you can put a biofeedback program on your laptop. Um, it's, there are two popular programs out there, $300, or, uh, yeah, 300 and ones, about 300, both of them. And um, you can do this at home. You get a sensor, you, it's the whole thing. Um, it's not as elaborate, of course, as what we can do in the, in the center, but it's, it's still pretty good. And um, a lot of people, now they even have a little, it's only like an iPod version um, where you can just measure a few things. And so people travel. I actually have some patients who are um, you know, traveling businessmen kind, and they have high blood pressure. They don't want to take medicines, and they're given a, a try with these little things. There's also a new, um, relatively new thing that uh, um, helps, it's a biofeedback thing, again, it's like a little iPod that measures your breathing and trains you, you do this for 15 minutes a day, it trains you to breathe in a particular way, very slow, with very long exhalation, and that lowers your blood pressure. At least six out of seven studies on it show that it does. So more research would be better, but, but that's, um, I think that's like a $200 thing. So exciting, biofeedback works. Um, I must say though, it, it, in the 60s, the, the, it, this was started at Yale in the 50s, and then when it came out in the 60s, people got so excited, like wow, you, we're gonna be able to, if you do biofeedback, you can control like all these different things. You'll be like the, 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 the swamis in, in India, you know, where they can you know, completely shut down their metabolism for a month or something. Um, it, this, this did not come to be true yet. Um, biofeedback, the, the, the drawbacks are it's expensive um, because you have to go back uh, at least a few times, but then, you, then you're trained, then you can do it yourself. Um, and um, it's finding use, but not quite as broadly as we had hoped, but for these conditions, um, and actually lots of others, these are the ones uh, that are where studies of good quality have been done, and there's a lot of areas that haven't been studied. Hypnosis, again, here's unlike meditation, we're trying to do something with hypnosis. You know, you, you have an objective, and, and the, the hypnotherapist is trying to help you achieve that objective. Hypnosis works by bypassing your critical discursive mind, going right to the subconscious. And it's nothing mysterious. It's not like on the, you know, on the TV shows and the movies and stuff where you, know, you snap your fingers and then you act like a chicken or something. Um, this does, you do not lose control. You're fully awake. You get relaxed and focused. And there's something about that state that makes the subconscious mind more um, uh, available, more attentive to the suggestion. So typically, the, the hypnotist will ask you, you know, what, what, do you, what would you like? Why are you here? And try to learn a little bit about you. And then, and I, it's preferable, it's, it's actually, I would insist that the hypnotherapist be someone with um, a mental health psychology training. Because it's important to know the psychology of the person to give them the right suggestion that's going to be effective to sort of speak at that subconscious level. So hypnosis has especially been proven in pain, uh, like things in procedures, things in the hospital, burns, changing the wound dressings on these poor kids that get these burns. Um, also, for people undergoing treatment for cancer, the nausea, anxiety, and pain elements have been improved with hypnosis. Irritable bowel syndrome, and uh, something called functional dyspepsia, which is basically um, some disorder of the upper gastrointestinal system, maybe the stomach or the esophagus, but that's not showing up on standard tests. You know, you, you, you have discomfort, um, you might call it indigestion, um, but there's no, it's not, a, it's not a reflux, it's not an ulcer, it's, it's, we can't, we're not actually sure what it is. This also, can, uh, at least early studies show this response to hypnosis. Um, 
guided imagery. This, this is, I think you've all heard of this one, especially in the context of, again, cancer care, um, using the imaginative capacity of the mind. And a, a guided imagery session, it was similar to hypnosis, um, a guided imagery session will try to recruit all your senses. So you, whatever image you're using, they'll try to tap into your, imagine what the smells are like, and what it looks like, and what it feels like, and what it sounds like. And that actually, there's a little bit of research showing that actually enhances the efficacy of the intervention. So um, uh, again, in the, in, the, in the hospital, this is effective for people undergoing surgery and after surgery um, and other, other causes of pain. So guided imagery is especially useful for that. People use it for all sorts of things. And it hasn't been studied. These, these are all understudied. So just because I list these three things doesn't mean guided imagery is not useful for other things. Um, I'm going to go a little quicker on this last two here, Tai Chi and yoga. So I like this twist. Somebody said, well, you remember I was talking about the directionality of, of uh, the, if, if we go with this idea of mind-body and we fall into that dichotomy, then, um, then uh, Tai Chi and yoga and you know, other such things are um, body-mind therapies rather than mind-body therapies because here you are deliberately doing something with the body uh, t and it's perhaps affecting the mind. Tai Chi, if you look at the research studies, and this is very important for elders, decreases fall prevention and fractures. Fractures are serious business. You probably know people who've had fractures. Uh, hip, the classic thing is a hip fracture in an older woman with osteoporosis. Um, that's, that can be quite an ordeal because uh, it's not just the hip. It's um, going into the hospital and getting out of the hospital. That's, that's a big deal. And then the rehab. My, my uh, beloved grandmother had a hip fracture when she was in... 90, and uh, it was quite an ordeal. Um, tai Chi is, is I love it. Um, I, I especially, I'm director of the mindfulness meditation programs at the Osher Center, and so I love Tai Chi because it's a form of mindful movement. You bring your full awareness to the, to the movement of your body. Um, it's very elegant, gentle, and yet it has these positive effects. It's good for recovering if you've been debilitated or gone through a surgery or something. Um, actually, studies showing if you've had a dramatic, if you had a bypass, a coronary artery bypass graft, um, it can help you recover from that. Great for stress reduction. We have a, a master at the Osher Center doing this, uh, Joseph, uh, for 30 years. Um, yoga, the, I love yoga, everyone loves yoga, <laughs> but the studies are poor. It's just starting now that to be studied in the West. There are a lot of studies from India um, most scientists here don't, don't accept the quality, the, the level of rigor of those studies. So these are conditions that have been looked at in India and shown to have benefit. Um, in the US, uh, yoga research is just beginning. There are four or five studies on back pain, one of which came out of our center, and um, which are promising. So people with chronic back pain um, might benefit from yoga, it looks like. Um, not to mention all the rest of us. Um, and I can't help noticing I have a colleague of mine in the audience who does a massage therapy. This would be another mind-body therapy. Um, in fact, some people are explicit about that and, and practice what they call somatic psychotherapy. So working with the body and eliciting um, psychological content that can be then worked with. One word about integration because we're I'm at the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. Um, let's combine these things. It works. Um, the famous one, Dr. Dean Ornish, uh, put together uh, diet, exercise, meditation, guided imagery, and progressive muscle relaxation in different combinations. You know, we didn't know that heart disease could be reversed. We thought, I was taught this as a medical student. You get a plaque, that's it. And it's a question of how much further the plaque progresses than you have your heart attack. He was the first one, in my knowledge, to show you can reverse the plaque. You can have an atherosclerotic plaque, and it can regress. And he did it with, with mind-body therapies and, and uh, diet and exercise. Um, Meyer Friedman, I'd mentioned to you already, he, he, when he saw these type A heart disease patients doing so poorly, he decided, OK, well, let's, let's get some psychologists in here and try to help these type A people. And he did, and it helped. Um, David Spiegel at Stanford, a psychiatrist, uh, did a famous study um, showing he, he compared women with metastatic breast cancer to get their um, regular oncology care 
and then another group got their regular oncology care, plus they were in a group that did self-hypnosis and, um, and some group therapy. They're, they lived 18 months longer on average than people in the uh, standard oncology group. Now, so this was striking and a lot of headlines and stuff. To be, to be fair about this, this idea that these therapies could actually extend your life, this is not established. And this study by Spiegel, there are pretty much, by my assessment, equal studies on both sides. Studies, there are three or four others like his showing, wow, you do these mind-body interventions, people live longer. And there are studies refuting that. Same, same design. So open question. I can say this for sure from all the other stuff I presented to you and just my own experience. These mind-body therapies can absolutely improve the quality of your life, whatever that is, illness or where, wherever, wherever you are. Um, and integrating, um, I think, is really a lovely opportunity that we have right now. So some conclusions, and then I want to uh, spend a few minutes on, on just a thought experiment with you that, that's really, I think, provocative and fun. So this phenomenon of mind-body medicine, it's just inherent to who we are. It's just, I think it's always been present, and it's still present, and we got away from it for, you know, 400 years and just put it back together, and so we're all excited because we're back together. Um, the way we think affects our health, or, or, or is, is related to our health, I'll be clear. The, um, our emotional state is related to our health, our degree of social and spiritual expression also. There are specific therapies, some of which I reviewed with you, that can be a benefit for certain conditions. <coughs> And I'm not shy to use them for other conditions. Um, the, most of these uh, have uh, very limited side effects. I didn't spend any time talking about that. There are some side effects. You'd, I wouldn't send everybody to a meditation class or everybody to, to biofeedback. You have to, you have to uh, select people. And, and there are some very small risks, but they're n risks nonetheless. And um, the big message, these can be used in conjunction. You don't have to give up anything. You can still do your good standard Western medicine and add these things and get, get benefit. Okay, so now I want to talk about, um, let's just think together, let's wildly fantasize together. There, there's, we can do whatever we want. There's no adult supervision, it's just you and me. And um, I want to talk about this work. Larry Dossey is a physician who's editor of, um, well at the time he did this stuff, he was editor of uh, um, Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine, and now he's editor of Explore. And he's written several books, and that's in, I think, he, uh, I was asked to make a bibliography, and I put it, I put it in your uh, thing. So these are his ideas, but I'm just captivated by them. So he says there are three eras of medicine. The first era, say, most, most of medicine, is era one, and it's mechanical or physical. Um, and it follows the, the, the laws of, of nature that we're so accustomed to, Newtonian physics and um, you know, the relationships of space and time that we're used to. So I, you know, something, it's mechanical. So you've got a tumor, I go in with my scalpel and I cut it out. Or um, you have a bacterial infection, I give you this pill, you put it in your mouth and it goes and it kills the bug. Um, very, very literal, occur occurring in time as we know it, in space as we know it, sort of very simple, clear. Um, uh, radiation, XRT is, is radiation therapy, physical therapy. So basically, all the stuff you think of about medicine, you know, straightforward, makes sense, no, no mystery. And um, I would also say this, that the scientific method that we've developed to study this is also constrained by, is, is era one, is also constrained by, by our notions of, of space, time, and Newtonian physics. Era two, and I actually, quibble about points, but I'll just present his, his view on this. Era two is mind-body medicine, which he says has happened in the last, you know, I don't know, 30 years or so, but the stuff that we spent most of our time on tonight, um, where this is beyond uh, the basic physics now, and it's, and it's, you know, the mind affecting the body, um, but that's still, um, it's still happening in time as we know it. Like I do something now and it affects my health now and maybe, maybe in the future. So the, the time relationship is still as we expect and as we know. Um, and then he proposes um, era three medicine. So let me say something about this first. Let me say a couple of things. So this is based on some findings in quantum physics. 
And this has become a hazardous popular thing to do, is to take quantum physics and apply it to like everything. And, and uh, some, someone wrote a good piece in the New Yorker, or New York Times, um, calling this quantum mysticism. And the idea that, yeah, you know, you can, you can control the world just by how you think. Um, and I, I would, I, I disagree with that um, halfway. I, I do think our thoughts influence things, but, um, but I think people take it too far and um, we really, it's, it's, every, it's still ultimately a mystery and you can't control everything and as, as much as you want to. And you can't just take the principles of quantum physics and plop them into you know, your, your, um, you know, your lunch break. Um, <laughs> So having said that, uh, let me describe first this word local and non-local. So the, the, and, and I'm no physicist, so I can easily just correct me when, it, when it's appropriate. Um, but um, uh, as I understand it, um, locality, non-locality, even, so, so we have Newtonian physics, quantum physics, and then this issue of locality or non-locality um, is actually um, potentially, this is, I know there's controversy about this, but it's potentially challenging our notions of quantum physics, just like quantum physics challenged our notions of Newtonian physics. And an Irish physicist, John Bell, uh, you know, these guys always start with thought experiments and then later it gets proven, you know, uh, experimentally. Einstein, all his stuff was, was, that was, was, was all in his head, it was all thought experiment, and then later we observed the planets and this and that, and it turns out, wow, he was right. So Bell's thought experiment, which later was proven experimentally, um, was, or suggests this, this possibility of non-locality. So if you look at subatomic particles, and I'm, I'm as dumb on this as you, but they have some characteristic, some electromagnetic character, they can have some electromagnetic characteristic called spin. And two subatomic particles um, that, that in relation to each other will have um, uh, complementary uh, spin, and it's just designated as plus or minus. So imagine, and it's, it's always, in, in, in when you're writing, it's designated as an up arrow and a down arrow. So these are two subatomic particles who have some relationship with each other, and they have electromagnetic property called spin that's, that's uh, complementary or opposite. Those, if you, if you separate those, and change the spin on one, the spin on the other one will change simultaneously. Not quickly or very soon, but simultaneously. Okay, so that's important. So time, there's no time there. It's simultaneous. The space question, so the time uh, paradigm is questioned there. Space paradigm is questioned because it doesn't matter where they are in relation to each other. You can even put a, an electromagnetic barrier between them, and it still happens, which suggests that the, whatever's going on between them is not happening in the way that we normally see things happen between things. You know, if I... Um, there's, there's, there's no apparent transfer of energy. So this breaks all the rules. Plus the fact that it's simultaneous means it's faster than the speed of light, which breaks Einstein's rules. And so this, is, this, this was very um, shocking and threatening, but it kept coming up in experimental data. And um, so, and, and, and there's controversy about that, and I'm not a physicist, but that's just my layman's understanding of it. And so it creates this, possibility that Larry Dossi fools around with, and that's what I want to do with you. It suggests that there are um, non-local forces that, that we don't, um, we can't even imagine basically, because you and I, we have notions of space and time that we're very used to, because almost everything we do apparently is in space and time that's so, you know, it's predictable as we, you know, we, like I know, you know, I'm so many, I'm so far from you, and if I hop, skip, I'll reach you. You know, I know the space between us. Or um, I know, you know, I've got to wrap up in so many minutes because we're all marking our time the same way and this sort of thing. But this is totally different. And so I know um, Mike Rabo was looking at some of the studies for prayer. And a lot of them are negative. You know, it's not very clear that praying helps people, their health, when you look at studies. But doesn't that seem peculiar to you to study that? It does to me because or at least to study it the way we're studying it. 
That's era one method. Um, if prayer is working, or if, any, if the way I think affects you and vice versa, I could imagine that happening somehow out of space and time. I mean, if, if we're going to get out there, let's just go all the way out there, you know, in terms of our thinking on this. So era three medicine is this, this idea, and it's just, a, it's just a fun idea. I don't, I don't think we can say anything more than that, that consciousness is something we share. And so it's, a, it's maybe, maybe a medium between us. It's like we're all in the same soup. And whatever I do in the soup can, might affect you, and vice versa. Let me, let me develop this a little bit more. Oh, let's do some more quotes, too. Don't look in your thing. Um, so, actually, this, guessing the authors on this, I won't, we won't waste time on that, but um, consciousness is a singular of which the plural is unknown. There is only one thing, and that which seems to be a plurality is merely a series of different aspects of one thing produced by a deception as in a gallery of mirrors. Is that some new age spiritualist on the street corner? No, it's one of the leading scientists of our lifetime. How about this? The, the idea of a universal mind or logos, that's the Greek term for this. The Greeks had this idea. Would be, I think, a fairly plausible inference from the present state of scientific theory. At least it is in harmony with it. This is a uh, British um, uh, physicist, one of, the, one of the sort of grandfathers of uh, this. Here's, a, here's a, another partial quote, and I'm going to do a little story. A human being is part of the whole, called by us universe. A part limited in time and space. He experiences his thoughts and feelings as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. Wow. So I think I'm separate from you. My body's over here after all. And it's my thoughts and my feelings are mine, and you know, I, I don't even have to reveal them to you, so I'm, I'm clearly separate from you, right? Well, or is this an optical delusion? And I, I bring up this thing um, I got from a meditation teacher. Um, so th that's the Big Dipper, right? And so here's the universe of stars. And we look up, and there's a bazillion stars. And we say, oh, there's the Big Dipper. But it's not really a Big Dipper, right? It's not a big, like, gravy ladle in the sky. <laughs> it is just the way we, uh, we've made a convention that, OK, that, we'll put those stars in a group and call it the Big Dipper. And then when I say Big Dipper, you'll know what I'm talking about. But if you, but that's, that's totally arbitrary. So this quotation, it's the same idea. A human being is part of the whole, a part limited in time and space. He experiences his thoughts and feelings as something separate from the rest. The Big Dipper is separate from the, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. So I, I like that. And let me finish the quote. Um, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us restricting us to our personal decisions and to affection for a few persons nearest us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. The stars in the Big Dipper, if the Big Dipper is just an arbitrary thing, you, shouldn't the stars in the Big Dipper be friends with the other stars in the area, you know? Um, <laughs> So who knows, who knows who said this? <coughs> Albert Einstein. Oh. Wow. Wow. So, so here's my just wild, unscientific um, conjecture. The phenomenon of mind-body medicine, I, for me, is pointing to um, an idea of unity between us and, and all things that is not only consistent potentially with our best science right now, but also with all the, what the spiritual, what our, our best wisdom traditions have told us for thousands of years. So that's compelling. We've got our best modern science and leading scientists saying this is possible. And then we've got the best wisdom that we can pull on short of science you know, it's like two sources of information. There's the ancient wisdom that we've <coughs> developed over thousands of years, and then there's science. And they're agreeing. So uh, to me, it's very, very, um, I don't know. I just, I feel like 
um, it's all a big mystery, and it, but it's, it's all very big, hopeful mystery. And um, when you get ill, as we all will get ill, just, just, I don't know, just remember that. Just remember that. I got this off the web. This was, this was, this was, the Mir space station had an art exhibit. Can you, the first art exhibit in space. And, and this, this was on it, I love it. The, the woman, the developing fetus in the womb is like connected to the sun, is connected to the universe, so kind of new agey, but I like it. Okay, so I should end there, I think. Um, thank you for your attention.